Good afternoon, Michelle. Hi, how are you? I'm all right, thank you. Um, this is Michelle Williams, and Michelle, you are an American actress. Um, I say that advisedly because there is something so very improbable about the fact that I'm talking to you because you are known mainly for being a film actress and Mike Alfreds, who is the subject of our conversation, is known mainly for being a theatre director. And so I haven't quizzed him that much about your relationship with him because I sort of wanted that to come from you. But I do know that I think you connected at some point about six years ago, something like that. And I, I'm just thinking, how on earth do you ferret out <laughs> Mike Alfreds, who's in his 80s? And why do you do that? And how did it all start? Um, our, our, um, we have sort of, uh, <laughs> the, the word that comes to mind for me is, you know, we, we have, um, it's almost like a, like, like, like you said, it's so funny. How would we meet where there's a, an ocean between us, um, generations between us. I wasn't aware of Mike's work for most of my career. Um, but what happened, really the, the beginning of the story goes back to when I was in London and I was making a movie called My, My Week with Marilyn and I was playing Marilyn Monroe. And it was just so hard for me. Uh, I had never attempted a character before who was so radically different from myself. Mm -hmm. And I was really struggling. It felt like I was, I had to break my own bones to then reform somebody else who didn't walk like I did, who didn't talk like I did, who didn't carry, who, whose center was somewhere different than mine was. Um, and it was just, I cried every day um, because it was so difficult. And there was a woman that I worked with there named Jane Gibson, who's a movement. I don't know if you know Jane, but she's a, um, a fantastic uh, a movement coach and, uh, and a dancer. And she was with me on that set. And she was the first, she was really my introduction to being a trained actor. I'm completely untrained. Um, I, I, didn't go to, I didn't go to school for acting. I didn't really even go to school. I've had teachers in my life, but never really in the way that you do that you do on your side of the ocean. You know, I come from, I think that the sort of like American school of acting is very, it's very naturalistic. It's um, kind of kitchen sinky. It's a little um, method. You know, that's kind of our bones is like this just sort of like very raw um, uh, 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 kind of exploration of the self. And so that if I, that's sort of my cultural inheritance and, but that wasn't working for me when I played Marilyn and Jane was giving me a different kind of education and it really clicked for me. And I really started to see some progress and it just intrigued me. How do I become someone other when I am limited, when I, when I am Michelle, when I, when I have been put in this body with these um, inclinations and, and um, habits. So how do I really, if I want to do this for a long time, how do I learn how to um, transcend myself or change myself? And Jane started me on that work and she introduced me over time to some really uh, some other amazing teachers, Alexander teachers. And so I would, every couple of years, I would kind of get like a new clue on the trail of this other kind of work that I was really interested in being able to do. And, uh, and then these are all, these are all friends of mine and everybody knows Mike, everybody has worked with Mike, they're all friends of Mike's, but they aren't who introduced me to Mike. One day, I guess I was feeling very brash or brave, I don't know which, and I somehow, I got Mike Rylance's email and I used it. And I asked him, I beg for forgiveness for the intrusion. And I said, could you just point me in a direction? 
Is there someone, somewhere, some book, some teacher, some school? Is there anything that you know of that's that was useful to you that you would be willing to pass on to someone else? And the one thing he said to me was Mike Alfred's. And uh, and so I tracked Mike down and we started a communication and I asked if he would ever be open to corresponding with me. And then um, if I came to him, would he be open to working with me? I was just going to say, look, you, you, you were doing Marilyn. You had this relationship with Jane Gibson. How much longer was it after Marilyn before you wrote to Mark and he recommended Mike? It was probably maybe six years. Oh, a long time. In between, yeah, quite a long time in between. Um, I, you know, when you watch a performer like Mark, what I'm always, what I'm struck by, and when I say struck, I mean struck. I mean like an like an arrow like through my heart that pins me to my theater seat because I cannot believe how how alive this person is, how how radically alive this person is. And what I said to Mark is it's more than a reminder of just how alive we can be as performers. It's a reminder of how alive we should be as human beings. You know, the kind of aliveness that he radiates in his performances, it's 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 double what what was what what we experience in our lives. It is just it is so it is you know like I said more than reminding me of how I want to act and perform. It reminds me of how I want to live as a human being, and that that kind of presence and attention and changeability and accessibility um, that's possible to us. That is a he he has shown me. And anybody who's been lucky enough to sit in one of those seats, he has shown me what kind of aliveness is possible, both on stage and off stage. So his being an audience member for his performances has been, uh, uh, they're just seminal moments in my, in my life. I'm, they changed me and, and definitely put me on the hunt for a different kind of, uh, a different kind of working and maybe even a different kind of living. So then I, so Mike and I started to correspond and I said, may I please come visit you? May I come to London? I will get myself a place to live. I will um, uh, get my daughter taken care of back in New York. And can I just come and spend a week with you and audit your classes? Because he was teaching at- um, Guildhall. At yeah, Guildhall. Just, and so I came and I visited for a week and I, um, I audited his classes and then he would work with me. I had a piece of material that I brought and we worked when he would finish his classes, he would work with me on this piece of material. And so I have never, I haven't seen a formal production of Mike's, but what I have seen are his kids perform his kids. I shouldn't call them kids, but his, his students um, perform, they did dealer's choice. And what I saw in that rehearsal room was just further confirmation of everything that, um, that Mark had shared with me. Uh, these students who were younger than I was by 10 or 15 years were doing things that I, one, I couldn't do. And two, I, I don't know if I'd ever seen it before on any stage ever. They were, he would snap his fingers and the students in e each character each actor would walk back out on stage with a completely different path and a completely different agenda and a completely different idea on how their character was going to get the thing that they wanted. And I just sat at Mike's feet with my jaw open, just thinking, what, what sort of magic is this? Like, I've got to get closer to this. So that was the first time that he and I actually got to meet and so that's yeah like he said it's maybe five or six years now that we've been corresponding and um and working together and we just finished working together formally we were just we've worked on a few things over the years that haven't really come to fruition and we just got to work on our first thing together that actually happened so um and it was a movie 
Um, you know, again, I keep on wanting to pull you back because, you know, you've, you've met Jane Gibson. You've had six years before you started to talk to Mark about his work and then connecting to Mike. Were you, I mean, were you feeling that somehow there was something missing in your, in your acting life? How does, a, you know, a famous actress kind of have that self analytical quality that's going, okay, no, I need more than, than I'm giving. And did you ever, just as a sort of second question, did you ever have any of your film directors, for instance, going, Michelle, you're not quite coming up to what I'm expecting? I mean, did you, or was it all to do with your own, your own journey personally, internally, and as an actress in your own head? Um, it was a really, it's, it's, it's very personal for me. It's, I, I love, I, I love acting on film. And I also love acting on stage. Acting on film can sometimes feel um, a little, a little bit more limited because you you can you're sort of in a you can be in a box. You feel sometimes a little bit like a floating head. The idea for me of like being a floating head that people project things onto isn't satisfying as a life's work. Um, I wanted to be capable of something that was more fully embodied. When you're on a stage, of course you are, you know, your, your fingers and toes are, um, are part of the picture and you're inhabiting, uh, you're inhabiting a space, not a frame. And so those were things that I wanted for myself to feel um, fully accessed and at home in my body and fully accessed and at home in, a, uh, in space. And those aren't really things that necessarily, sometimes those things don't really come to bear when you're talking about a, a camera, because a camera is so sensitive and, and it's um, so close to you that um, it's really asking for a kind of delicacy. And, and that's great, but I also wanted to have this other skill set um, where I could be freer and more playful and, um, and run a performance through my entire system rather than sort of from like my neck up mm. and and really again that was that was born because of Marilyn because of playing somebody who was so far from me and not knowing how I was how I could get there I didn't know how to put my center in another place I didn't know how to um, break myself of myself and, but I really wanted it. It was, I, I couldn't do it and it was scary. And I, I could, it was very hard for me to do these things um, that were required. There was no real joy, ease, effortlessness, mm. uh, inspiration. It, it felt like breaking bones and banging my head up against the wall until blood came out. Now that was all, that was my experience. Off, that was my experience off screen in sort of in between action and cut was just, there was just very little joy. And sometimes I would do things that felt, you know, better than others and things that I was more proud of than I was others. But underneath, I was just aware how much I was struggling to get the result that I, that I wanted. And, uh, and so really, I kind of think, even though I've been doing this since I was very young, I've been acting since I was 12, I really think I was, I was 30 when I played Marilyn. And I really think that in some ways, that's kind of where, um, where the career that I have now, like where that began, where the seeds of that are, which really is, is rooted in, um, uh, in, in training, which is really rooted, I, I, I really take it back to Jane Gibson. Uh, it, it's really rooted in a kind of, in a kind of training that I think is hard to find in America. Mm. Uh, you know, it's interesting, you've used the word, cent you know, it, where the physical centre was for, for Marilyn. And you've said that a couple of times. Did you, is that a sort of understanding that you got on the set for Marilyn? Or was it something that you knew about before? Had you ever thought about that in terms of, you know, the physicality of a character? Or was it a, a, a revelation for you? And, and where was her physical centre? 
where did you feel that her center was? Yeah, I, you know, I really, I had never been asked to play a character who was so different from me. So I had never really had to reckon with how could I, how could I, you know, it, it's funny. It's like, is it, because ultimately it is, it is all still me, but rather than being locked in one place, physically, spiritually, emotionally, what Mike's work taught me to do is that because it's all still me but I have more I have more access to all parts of myself and to all to all parts of myself intellectually emotionally and physically and that they're all connected and I think the other thing that's that you know what I've been what I was taught up until that time is that you really work from the inside out mm. so that you build a character um because you don't, the, the idea is that it doesn't feel artificial because you're working with your own experiences and emotions and uh, history. And so that you're, you feel authentically connected to the character because you're using your own authentic experience. And like I said, that's great, but this physical thing really broke me wide open because what I realized was a physical, a, a small physical change immediately releases you from who you have always been. Mm. And, and again, this is all really internal stuff for me. It wasn't necessarily that somebody was saying you should do this or you should be that, or um, it was just my own kind of understanding of where I was coming, where, where I was coming up against, I always, I, I say coming up against the edge of my own ability. Mm. I could feel where my, where I stopped being able to expand and where I stopped um, knowing what to, or where I stopped, I shouldn't even say knowing what to do because I don't always know what I'm doing, but um, um, wh where my limits were. Mm. And I so badly wanted to push that the next inch or two, you know, just gain a little bit more, freedom. Um, and when I found those physical, when I found what a big difference a physical change made, that's when I started thinking, oh, there's, there's a whole other world out there for me. This is just the beginning. Like I'm just, I'm just scratching at mm. you know, something that I think is going to be a door. And I think like, if I just keep my head down and keep working, like maybe I can just swing it wide open. And, and that's really been, so now I'm 41. So like the last 11 years of my life have really been about this kind of um, expansion. I missed that last word. What was the last word? Expansion, just about, because it, you know, it's, all, it's just trying to expand within yourself. Yeah, yeah. And, um, you know, it, it, it's so, it's so, kind of unusual in some ways because you know it, as a film actor um i'd say 80 percent of the film actors you see you go to see them because they are who they are you know and if you see them transformed in any shape or form you either you're dissatisfied because they're not playing that part that you expect them to play or you know a, a, a bit like you with those students in dealer's choice your jaw drops because you think oh goodness they can actually play something slightly different from from what they normally do but for you as a film actor that is it that's a kind of unusual journey for you to go on to actually go no i need to i need to uh, to kind of inhabit all of my body to 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 be able to express these people and presumably I don't know, you see, because as I said to you before we started recording, I'm not, I'm, I haven't followed your career as such, but have you been offered parts that have stretched you in a way that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be stretched previously? Well, I think, you know, I've, I've in a way, Yes, I mean, I really constantly, I and mean, I do look for those things. I'm, I, I always want to do things that I haven't done before and that will feel like a new, um, a new 
a new adventure, both for myself and for anybody who wants to watch what I'm doing. Um, because doing the same thing, you know, it really can only carry, uh, can carry any interest for so long, I think. So, uh, you know, but Marilyn was, again, was a really big turning point for me. That's certainly not how anybody had sort of seen me before and certainly not how I saw myself. Uh, and, but it was immediately a risk that I wanted to take, you know, anything. I love jumping off a cliff in my work. I like to be very, um, routine and orderly and safe in my life, but I mean, I love an opportunity to uh, gamble when it comes to um, performing and what I'm gonna do next. And I, all, you know, for a long time, I've had this feeling that I'm always kind of doing things that I don't know how to do. They're always just a little bit of head of where I am developmentally and artistically. The things that I'm taking on, I don't quite have the skill set yet for them. And that excites me. I love learning. I love learning. I like learning in real time. I like learning in front of people. I like learning on the job. Um, it gives me a thrill. And Marilyn, even though I had done things before that that were, you know, that asked a lot of me and that I felt really proud of and connected to and um, but Marilyn was the first like, transform, total, total transformation that uh, I'd been that I'd been asked to do. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, as you know, we've got a sort of the whole of Mike's life and the whole of the way in which he works is now recorded, and we've got a million episodes, and he goes through. He goes through all his career, but then he goes through his techniques. And I, I'm going to throw stuff at you and then say, you know, did you know anything about this beforehand? What the first one that I, I because I, as a young man, I was an actor. And the idea of an objective is something that nobody ever threw at me. You know, nobody ever said, so what's your objective, Tony, in this scene or whatever? But I've said to Mike that sometimes I felt that instinctively one might have known what it was that you wanted in a particular scene without necessarily articulating it. Did you have any, did you know about objectives as a kind of way of working before you started working with Mike? I had, I had, you know, I was, I was familiar with, I was familiar with the language and, uh, you know, I'd been, I'd really been obsessed with, 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 and being taught since I was very, very young. I was always reading, you know, Uda Hagen's book and uh, Respect for Acting and Stanislavski. I was, I, I had always, I really wanted a kind of methodology for the thing so that it didn't feel so helter-skelter and like praying for rain. You know, I really wanted something that felt um, a little more reliable than that. So I've been familiar with all of those words, but I'd never really been able to synthesize the, the, the that intellectual part of it to the point where you um, where they those are just sort of things in the back of your head instead of things in the front of your head. Uh, yeah. um, and for me, the real key was this physical work. This physical work is what gave me the ability to be completely present. Have 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 all of this kind of you know the all of the work that you do ahead of time with Mike, the, you know, all of the list making and the objectives and the um, super objectives and, uh, and points of concentration. So all of that is kind of brewing in, in the background, but the physical work really takes over. And so it allows your unconscious mind to go in so many, it's, you know what I think of it like, I think of it like meditating. I think of it like when you are you, that kind of meditation, which is mantra based, which I think is like transcendental meditation, and they give you a word to concentrate on. And when you're concentrating on that word, the rest of your mind is completely free, as opposed to sort of trying to concentrate on just freedom itself. You are concentrating on um, something that allows your unconscious to unravel. And that's what I've found, especially on this last job that Mike and I worked together on, is that 
uh, it allows you to kind of have uh, both brains up and running at the same time, like your left and right are really communicating with each other. And, and that really, you could really translate that work when you went off to Los Angeles, you could translate some of the work you'd done with Mike. Oh, oh, some of it, all of it. I mean, I, I, I said this to Mike the other day, I just said, I just hope I can make it clear. You we're there with me. You we're there with me. Every day, every take. What I call it now is, you know, I love, I love his Bible different every night. Um, but for me now, for taking it into a film, I call it different every take. Because what he gave me, and this is, you know, this is a few weeks of, of work that we did together. Um, uh, uh, all kinds of things, you know, just, you know, go, very pointedly going through the script, um, uh, you know, talking about uh, objectives and super objectives and what, what she wanted and how she was going about getting the thing that she wanted, going through the efforts, taking me, going through, you know, all of the efforts and then combinations of the efforts and points of concentration. And all of these things gave me such, I mean, just like a, a stack of material really that I could take with me into work every day and have as a point of reference so that every single take is a completely, look, I mean, sometimes, you know, sometimes you're, sometimes you don't hit it, but the idea is that every single take is a completely fresh experience and you are never, I mean, we all know this, you know, you're never really supposed to repeat yourself. You are never supposed to go into a take thinking, oh, it was really good what I did last take. I'm just going to go try and do that again. It's fool's errand. It's impossible. It, you can't make it happen. Or if you do make it happen, it's actually a dead thing because you're trying to recreate something that was actually alive. But what Mike's, what, what the way that Mike works, the material that I was able to take with me gave me something to think about every single take of every single scene, I was working with something new. And so each take, some better than others, was a completely fresh experience. And all of this work that we had done was in my unconscious. And so, and, and I could call upon it, I could just sort of think the thought about Oh, remember this thing that he said, or remember what happened in that point of concentration, or, you know, this time think about uh, where, where her center is, or where are you breathing from, or just, you know, all kinds of things. I mean, lists and lists of material that I was able to uh, reference and then use and then be surprised by what had happened, because it would lead me to a place um, that I, of course, that I couldn't have planned. Uh, there's uh, there's a lovely um, a, a, a lovely sort of analysis of that by um, Sean Thomas in one of the where she it's she said it's sort of like layers of water sort of being placed one upon the other and so you just get this incredible lake that you can draw upon as it were when when the moment arrives and it's not necessarily that you do it intellectually it's just there it's just living inside you and really it's living in your body. You know, you're, it, it has, it's transcended become being an intellectual process and it's become, especially because Mike is such a believer in time. And, you know, unfortunately I have never gotten to work with him um, on, I mean, I've never been directed by him on stage. I certainly felt like he was with me on this film, directing me in my head, but he, uh, uh, but I know what a great believer he is in time and the power of time and the power of, um, of rehearsing for a long time and you know and I the time that he and I spent working on this plus the amount of time that I spent rehearsing for the film itself once I was in Los Angeles and the time that I had spent you know it's sort of it really it gives you a rich history with this person and mm. so that when you when you work through these exercises with him that what they give you are the character's memories. They give you possibilities for the character. They give you sort of like a dream life that you just get to, a dream life sounds maybe a little bit too woozy, but it gives you a kind of, it gives you their memories. It builds like a memory bank of mm -hmm. um, things that they could be thinking uh, moment to moment, scene by scene. And those are kind of stored because it's a creative process. 
you know, those are the you you hang on to them. They're stored, and they actually grow over time. And then they start to relate to other things that happen in your day, or or other things that happen, you know, as you sort of go through the filming process. They, you know, you're reminded of things based on what you've just done. So it's 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 just so generative. It just feels like it's it's always building. It's always building. And the more comfortable that you get with these, you know, the efforts were a huge turning another turning point for me when I started to get comfortable with those um, and you concentrate on one of those efforts and you have no idea where it's going to take you mm -hmm. because you aren't actively thinking about it but your body is taking the lead your body is in charge you know there's this um, saying like the body keeps the score and um, that's really been true for me with these efforts is that the when I'm effort to effort, because I'll try sort of different things, take to take. Okay, well, what if I, you know, what if I'm, what if I'm slashing on the inside and dabbing on the outside? Like, what's that going to feel like? And it's a, it takes me to a totally unconscious place that I never could have anticipated um, with my logical mind. Um, j just in case somebody doesn't know what we're talking about with efforts, what we're talking about is what's called Laban efforts. Uh, which Mike does go into in great detail in one of his talks. And, um, you know, I think I've found them unbelievably liberating as well. And I know that when I've worked with, with students, you know, they, they've, I hope, have found them fantastic. As long as you give yourself over to them in some shape or form. Just as a sort of technical thing, when you, when you were working on lab and efforts with Mike, were you sort of in a Zoom situation like we are, in a room by yourself and he was getting and you had to kind of get over that self-consciousness of being in a room being watched while you were being light and and direct or whatever it might be that's exactly what we did is we were in a zoom room and i um uh, borrowed a friend's house because you can't really have kids running around while you're trying to roll around on the floor and um and, and we would go through the efforts together. You know, when I when I first started working with him and he first sort of introduced me to the efforts when I was in London and I was uh, uh, watching the work that he was doing with the students and then I would work with him after hours, it was so difficult for me. Um, but I stuck with it because I wanted it so badly. I just, I wanted to be, I, I, it's like I could understand what he was talking about, but I just couldn't do it. I couldn't figure out how to move my body like that or how to take that thought and let it affect my body so after all of these years to now be able to not only understand what he's saying but do it it's such a relief it feels so good i'm so willing to make a fool of myself and jump and roll and you know stroke a wall I would do I would do anything. I would do it on the ceiling if he asked me to, because it feels oh, such a relief to finally sort of be there and to really be able to be taught by him because um, because I can access it now. So and honestly, the Zoom situation has been great because I used to go over to London just to see him and just to work with him. And and now we can do it from we can do it at home. So uh that it's actually been like a real blessing um to be able to see him like this then COVID and quarantine and all of this and to be able to keep in touch with him and check in with him and, um and and he was really able to see you know i wouldn't think that he would be able to see i would experience a place where i was sort of holding myself back and he saw it over zoom when I'm back up against a wall and like trying to climb on it, he can see where I need to um, put more energy. And he would always be right. And I'd say, how can you, how can you see that? And he said, well, I'm, that's because I'm the teacher. Of course I could see it. So, you know, it was really a very effective medium for us to work. Um, even that it has its downsides. It was, we, we really found a way to, um, um, to, to get to power through those. And, and uh, the, the I, I mean, it's fascinating us talking about the, the body and the physicality because it's something that I, I kind of knew instinctively as, as a young actor myself and, you know, how the slightest 
shift in your body, be it in your eyes or in the way you hold your mouth or anything, starts to just, it, it sort of floods you, doesn't it, with the, oh, with a whole load of other stuff. Yeah, that's really well said. It just, it starts to flood you. And I think that was the experience that I had that was just so transfixing was I can affect that much change just by where I'm holding my head, just by where I'm locating the energy in my body, I can feel so completely different. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's hard, it's kind of scary in a way because, you know, you could, you can, I mean, if you chose to now, you could just switch off and kind of become some kind of awful, you know, dragon or something if you felt like it because you, because you have that control over uh, uh, the kind of that lovely feeling of, of of having more and more vocabulary as it were as a, as an actor it's the same with any any kind of craft is you know the the bigger your vocabulary as a singer or a guitarist or a pianist or whatever it might be and then things become sort of easier in some in some areas because you're kind of not thinking, oh gosh, I've got to get my fingers absolutely right here. Well, thank God for that. I mean, I always say it's just, it's the, it's the great benefit of getting older is that you, you get more fluidity in your work and that, you know, and, and that you can also start to see direct results from application. You know, I've, 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 I really lusted after this, this way of working for a number of years and I really applied myself to it. And now I'm finally starting to live in the, um, in the, in the payoff of that, which is it's fun. Yeah. It's because I can, um, because it comes so much more easily to me now. So I can, I can change from state to state to state with, um, with the kind of ease and rapidity that I, that I, that I, that I wanted. And, and so I can, you know, it, it makes it makes it much easier to take direction because you can, um, you can sort of, you can just drop it in and then it comes out sort of very immediately. So it's 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 very fun it, um, to work with, and uh, and it, I don't experience I don't suffer anymore. Mm. Yes, because that's something very interesting about the the work that Mike does because he isn't. Uh, the kind of American idea of the method, you know, where you kind of have to mine all your suffering or whatever it might be. And I mean, he makes a wonderful comparison with Hamlet. You know, you, you, you're not a prince. You're, you know, your father is probably might have died, but it's unlikely that he was poisoned by your uncle, you know, and, you know, your mother is not. The, the, these, these circumstances, a bit like you with Marilyn, you know, you are a, a distance away from Marilyn Monroe. Um, but uh, you know what what the actors have a kind of permission they don't have to kind of live everything off stage as it were they 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 live it in the present when they're there what i find is that if i locate myself correctly appropriately for the character physically that those emotions are complete their emotions are are available to me. Mm -hmm. And that when I, when I was sort of kind of locked in a position as Michelle, I could only experience my own emotions, my own, but when I orient myself correctly, physically, their emotions are accessible and available to me. Mm. Um, you know, and some of that is, some of that has to do with breath work also. Some of that has to do with the thing that Mike says over and over, you know, you know emotions are carried on the breath. And, 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 and all of our impulses start in the gut. Mm. Mm. And sometimes just as simple of a thought as that would have the most transformative, radical effects on the take. All right, so this time we're just gonna think all the impulses come from the gut. So concentrate on your gut and action. And then that would carry me off in another direction. But then I don't use the same thing, take after take after take, I sort of, go back to the drawing board and everything that Mike and I have talked about and, you know, sort of try something new, but, you know, the stimulating something for me, I've just found that coming from a physical place is actually 
that's the straight road to truth for me. I'm a slightly facetious comment would be how does the how does the director who's working with you because you said that actually a directors film directors don't encourage you to do the same take but there must be times when the, the, you must send them absolutely spare because you've done something no well here you know so it's a, it's sort of a tricky balance because you you do you do have to um Look, I always like to figure out wh where is this scene going to take place? Like, where, where do I feel inclined to move? What do I want to touch? Where am I? You know, it's, it's nice when you can sort of figure those things out yourself, you know, sort of be on your feet and walking around and just kind of um, seeing where the scene wants to live physically. And, and at a certain point, you really do have to pin things down because for some shots, for some scenes, for some movies, for some directors. I've done movies where you have a tremendous amount of freedom and they say, we're just putting, we're just sticking the camera over here, do whatever you wanna do, it's a static shot, go wherever you want, the room's totally available to you. And so, and so I get to live like that. And then sometimes I come to work and the director says, this is the shot that I have planned and I need you to stand over here and look up on this line and then you know, spin around and get on your knees before you go into the monologue. And somehow you have to find a way to apply all of the freedom that Mike has given you to that. And you know what? You can. Um, they're just and and because they're they're just two different ways of working. And one of it's it's very they're they're both great challenges. You know, one where how I'm okay. I'm in charge of sort of blocking this and finding the the physical light for this scene. So what is that? And or, or another experience where you're being told sort of where to go and what to do. So how am I going to breathe life into that? Um, they're both totally valid and they're both, you know, very exciting challenges. Um, and, you know, and, and I think that, it, you know, and, and the other great thing about the efforts is, and Mike said this to me and I thought about it a lot. He said, you know, the efforts, you don't even have to do anything when you're working with the efforts you don't even have to move a muscle. The effort can be completely inside of yourself. So, you know, it, it has perfect application for film. And I, the experience that I just had is sometimes my director would pick up on it and he would say, whoa, 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 you're being, what, what, what went on there? Because that's, you're really um, uh, 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 thinking the wrong word, but not recessive, but you're really, you're sort of, you're letting things happen to you too much instead of you know, you're, you're too indirect. And I'd be like, oh, okay, he could see what I was, you know, I was being, I, that's what, that was what I was concentrating on. And, you know, and it's, and it's, and he was, he, he saw that. So, um, so these things really can just work as thoughts. They can run through your whole body or they can just like, you know, stay inside you as your own little secret. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Mark Ryland says something which is uh, kind of tricky in a way because he says quite often he gives gives note to the director, gives notes to the director about the sort of thing that the director might want to give him notes about. <laughs> so for instance, he'd say, you know, think about points of concentration. You might want to give me, for this take, you might want to give me a different point of concentration. Because I, I think the generalized point he makes is that an awful lot of film directors aren't necessarily actor directors. They're, they're not necessarily always brilliant with actors. Right. And I'm afraid that's probably true of an awful lot of theatre directors as well. I think a lot of people... No, you never really know what you're going to get. Some are, some aren't. And, and there's, you know, challenges. Each, each has its own challenge. But when you're making a film or, or a television series, it's really a director's medium, you know, because the director is really, is really telling the story. They're really guiding the audience. You know, this is what's important now. And, you know, this is where I want you to look. And like, this is what I'm, where I'm trying to take your subconscious. You know, the director is really in charge. But when you're doing a play, it's really the actor's medium. Yeah. Um, so, and it's, 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 it's exciting to sort of go back and forth between both, you know, and, and I'm, 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 and I, you know, some some film directors don't exactly know how to talk to actors, but then they're giving you tons of freedom and sort of like letting you run amok and like letting you kind of make up whatever you want to do, which is why it's so great to have this work that Mike does 
you know, at your side because you are you you are you are ready and you have your own sort of um, you know Mary Poppins bag that you can pull into and take <laughs> new and exciting things out to thrill yourself and your scene partner. Um, tell me, Michelle, would, would you? Um... Uh, I mean, are you going to do any theatre or is film kind of where you're at, maybe? No, I'm, um, I'm going to do another play next year. I mean, as we were supposed to, we were supposed to do it before shut down and Mike and I had worked on it, but then, you know, the, the world changed. Um, and Mike and I worked a little bit really more over like the sort of the telephone, but I've done, um, uh, I've done uh, a bunch of off Broadway and a couple things on Broadway and like uh, another thing that, I'm, I'm looking to do that Mike and I have already worked on that we're excited about and that we hope happens because um, uh, we enjoyed working on it together the first but, time. But it's, but it's not something that he would direct as such. No, but that's my ultimate wish. I said that to him the other day. I was like, oh gosh, what I wouldn't give to, you know, yeah. in your, your yeah. So that's just a little oh. wish I'll just throw out into the universe. Yes, well, I mean, it would be he, he, um, they had to stop rehearsing the piece that they were going to do on the day that everything locked down, in fact. So, whether it'll ever get resurrected or not is, is another matter, isn't it? Well, I hope so. I would definitely get on an airplane to see that. Yeah. All right, Michelle, I think, I think we've covered life. <laughs> I mean, I, I leave that up to you. You're the director. You're the director here. I think I, I think we've um, I think we've talked enough. So it's been a real pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much, Michelle. Likewise. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you. The, the movie that I just finished was a Steven Spielberg film. With all the work that Mike and I had done together, was I just. I just felt like I was a child and I was just on this jungle gym and I was just climbing and swinging and my breeze was in my hair. I just didn't know. It was just play. It was just pure play. From the moment, I mean, from the moment I started to the moment we were up, I just went to work and I played. And, and, it, and it made it fun for me and for everyone around me because you just don't know where you're going to go. And then all of a sudden you've taken everybody that you're performing with into a, a new world. And like all of a sudden there you guys are in a, in, a, in a way that your conscious mind couldn't have arrived at. So I, that's exactly it. Just playing, just playing. Did Steven Spielberg know that you'd done all this work with Mike? He did. No, he knew that I had, um, that I had spent a, 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 a large a big amount of time prepping with my beloved teacher uh, in London. He was just able to build on everything that Mike and I had done, you know, and then, you know, he could add into it and say, oh, what about this? Or like, try this. Or what if you were thinking about this? And because, um, you know, that's really the language that Mike and I were speaking already. It was so pleasurable, so fun, so easy for me to drop in his ideas on top of everything else that Mike and I had been thinking about. Um, no, it was really, it was a, it was a great, it was like making a great soup, you know, and just, it had been stewing for so long. And then you just get to throw in all these other ingredients on top of what you've already been, you know, what you've already been cooking at home. Uh, the, the other thing is, did, did I get the sense that you were saying that your freedom, your playfulness had an effect on other people? Well, I mean, I think ideally that's really what, what, you, what you want in any circumstance is, you know, that it's like jazz, you know, I'm playing this part and then you're playing this part and then I get excited about what you're doing and you build on what I'm doing. And then all of a sudden you have something that, you know, it almost shouldn't even make sense, but it does, you know, and I find that, you know, this work is like, it really can push things to extremes where sometimes you're in a territory and you're like, is this good or is this bad? Am I having too much fun? because you're so full you have so many ideas that you can bring to bear and you have so many places that you can go physically um and and if you can go to those places physically you can go to those places emotionally because your emotions live in these different parts of your body 
And so when you're accessing these things, you are really, um, you're really running like a, you know, a 12 cylinder engine or something. And sometimes you think, is this going to be too loud? Like, is this thing going to be too noisy? Are people going to say, oh, you know, back up your truck? Um, but ideally, you should be working to, you know, excite both yourself and your own creative, creative imagination, and also your partners, because they're the ones that are in the scenes with you over and over again. And, and if they, and if you, if you, if you can, you know, stimulate them in a different way, then what they give you back is different. And then you're really, you know, then you really are different, different every night or different every take. Um, and that's, you know, it's just, it's a magical place. And like I said, you know, that what, what this work really takes me back to is like, it's not just a way to perform. It's not just a way to act. It's really a way to live. Um, how can we, you know, notice each other and how can we, mm. um, how can we excite each other and how fully can we express ourselves and how much attention can we pay? You know, I would find on this last movie that I did that Mike and I worked so deeply on, you know, between action and cut, I just thought I have to be more like this in my life. You know, I'm, mm. I'm so accessed here. Mm. And this is really what I'm going to strive for when I go home or when I'm talking to my friends or playing with my baby, you know, it's, it's that kind of, that kind of attention. It's fascinating that because um, because I I've often sort of talked to him about the idea of what how of that idea of being present, and the idea of actually seeing you're you're, you're playing Hamlet or whatever, and, and actually seeing Rosencrantz, seeing Claudia, seeing your mother. Somehow, not just seeing through your frozen eyes, but somehow being available for what they give back to you. And I think that's a really scary thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a scary thing both in, you know, the craft that you have, but also in life. Because in a way, if you are seeing that other person, you are taking responsibility for them as well, because you are letting them into you somehow. And I find, I, I think that's, that's a, that's a big ask of people. I mean, obviously we want to do that with our kids, don't we? Right, you do. Well, I mean, that's, you know, it's like one of the great things about having kids is that's the kind of play that they're engaged in. You know, that's the kind of like, that's like walking through the wardrobe. You know what I mean? Like that's that's going to Narnia. But, but they are able to do it and then they always have a safe home to return to. You know, they always then sit down for a meal. And I kind of think about this work a little bit like that. Like, these are just places that I can explore. I can always go back to being Michelle. Like that's a safe resting place. I know where she lives. I know what she sounds like. I, I know how she holds her body. Like that will always be available to me. That's home. So it really makes it quite safe yeah. actually, to access these other, you know, places in your in your body and in your imagination because yeah. you do have a you do have a home to go to. Yes. And you, have to, you have to know where to start if you're going to, you know, kind of veer and careen so wildly in this work. But you, you know, you have a starting place and that's 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 your safe place. That's home. And that's really interesting you say that, because, again, that's a Sean thing. She said at some point when I was she was working with Mike and she did quite a few productions, she realized that she had to have a kind of center that was her and that was strong and that was not going to be, um, you know, the, 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 the critic in her head wasn't going to rip her to pieces. Because if you're able to take yourself to all these different places, all these different realities, if you're really to take, if you're able, while still using the instrument of yourself to really move away from your own habituations, then, you know, the places you really can't be hurt or injured because they aren't actually talking about you. You know, they're talking about places that you travel inside of yourself, but they're not talking about the heart of you, Michelle, because you're accessing these other uh, areas consciously and, and unconsciously so so that it actually gives you a safe home to return to. If you use a kind of a, a, a more method idea or, you know, sort of mining your own experiences over and over, then you really do leave yourself very vulnerable. I think ultimately it's a combination of these things. Like, I think ultimately you can't really 
it's very, you, you know, you know what you know, you experience what you've experienced. So in some way you are really beholden to those things, but, but this work can help you, you know, expand and open up and sort of find new, new areas to express through, but it, it does also give you, you know, a kind of clean space to walk into and be yourself again. Mm. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, that, it, that, that's kind of fascinating. The other thing is, um, is that you said the word attention, the giving, giving so much attention to something. I think whatever field it is in life is a wonderful, wonderful, healthy thing to be doing, isn't it? It reminds me of another incredible thing that Mike said to me that I thought about just constantly on this last film. He said, um, complete what you fantasize about doing. And I find that in our lives now, we get so little time to fantasize about what we want to do because we are so um, kind of cut off um, at every um, pass by technology. You know, oh, the thing just ring or the, it buzzed or it beeped or it, you know, jumped or whatever, you know, you're constantly being interrupted. And by something that tells you that it's very important, that you have a message, you need to get back to somebody. They called you, they emailed you, they, you know, they, they, they messaged you twice. So why didn't you get back to them? Complete what you fantasize about doing. I mean, and that was a product of us working on the lobin together, working on the efforts, because you know, you do these efforts to the point, you know, where you are so involved in this world, you're spending 10, 15. 20 minutes, you know, obsessing over these three dynamics, but it, it, it helps you remember that human beings are meant to obsess in this way. We're meant to become transfixed and intrigued and impassioned by something and complete what you fantasize about doing really carried me, I, I, you know, through these takes and through these scenes, how much further can I take this thing? How much more can I let myself fall and explore? Because in my day-to-day -day life, I am constantly cut off from that, unless I'm playing with my children. Yeah. So, you know, that, that idea, you know, he just drops, I mean, having a conversation with Mike is a priceless experience. You know, he's just you are catching pearls of wisdom from his devotion to his, his life and his life's work. So these, these things that he says that fall off of him, I mean, I'm just catching them like this and then writing them down as fast as I can and then, and then living with them and watching the kind of magic that happens when I work with his, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that, you know, it's, it's what all, all of his actors talk about really is that we don't like to plan things. We don't, we don't, if I, if I know what I'm going to do, um, well, that's boring. You know, that sounds like making a list and going to the grocery store. Like I know what I'm going to get and I'm not open to, you know, what, what might be out there for me. So these things that he works with, they just, they take you to a place that's beyond your imagination. Uh, my comfort zone is being threatened. I can't say it any better. My comfort zone is being threatened. But you, that. Which is interesting when you said about the the beginning of working on Laban, that you said initially yeah, I, I was couldn't kind of, do it. I yeah. couldn't do it. But that that precise feeling is very exciting to me. I can't do this, but I want to. I want to be able to do it. I want to be capable of doing it. Also, I think because you and I have seen, you know, you much more than I. I didn't get to see those early productions. I've but I've you know I've seen Rylance and I've seen. And I've seen his students and I've seen my students working at Guildhall. And I just thought, oh, I want that. I want that. I want that for myself. I want to experience what they're experiencing because when I experience them, I experience them differently than I do most performers. Like they really just, they, they really speak to me and they really want, they really make me want to be alive in a, in a more vigorous way. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to give people that experience when they watch me. So I have to chase this thing. Mm -hmm. And even if it's very painful, you know, it's also the sort of lesson that you always get over life though, too, you know, uh, no pain, no gain. Like you, you have to sacrifice something to get to the other side of it. You know, you have to sort of get through the thistle to get to the fruit. So I, 
yeah. that that exact experience of not being able to do what Mike was talking about was was just what I was looking for. And he's unstoppable. I mean, he's unstoppable. He's just he's indefatigable. You know, our, our work together. I would tire out much before he did. Yes. <laughs> and then he's 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 um he's giving himself a hard time because he can't remember a word. Well, I said, Mike, I can't remember words either. I'm, you know, no. always searching for a, a word or somebody's name or, yeah. you know, just yeah. sort of, it's it's taken him back down to a, a slightly more human level, but he's still, a, he's still heroic. Thank you for watching. Um, and I hope you enjoyed that, uh, that chat. And if you did, would you press the like button and also um, the, uh, the subscribe button, that would be great. And if you wanted to be given alerts to when the next one is happening, just press the bell button. Um, if you want to put any comments or any questions underneath here, underneath the video, please do. And at some point I will um, re-interview Mike, as it were, and put some of these questions to him. So um, I look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you.